On today's Go, we're on top of the world. Welcome to Go Only on Shaw TV. I'm your host, Vanessa Ibera. And on today's show, we're coming to you from the newly renovated Rendezvous Lodge here on top of Blackcomb Mountain. Now, along with its new black contemporary design, turns out it's its new menu that's causing quite the buzz here on the mountain. They have everything from hearty soups, Thai bowls, burritos, you name it. So on today's show, we're talking to staff above the multi-million dollar renovation, and we'll also try out some of that food. Speaking of food on today's show, we're also heading to Whistler Village to treat our taste buds to apres ski, and we'll also head up to Pemberton to introduce you to one restaurant redefining comfort food. So let's get started. Here at the Rendezvous Lodge, they pride themselves on only hiring people passionate about food. And if there's anyone who's passionate, it's head chef Wade Wright. It may be the calm before the storm here inside the Rendezvous Lodge kitchen, but head chef Wade Wright is fired up. Uh, everything's uh, topped up, any problems? Uh, no problems so far. People and cooking. It's two passions that this Australian native has had for as long as he can remember. My mum's a really good cook, so it started there. I'm a creative person, so I just, I love, I love making something from nothing, basically. Shortly after high school, Wade enrolled in a culinary arts program. One of his biggest highlights was apprenticing at a Hyatt hotel. They had a fish restaurant, a steak restaurant, an Italian restaurant, so I got a little bit of uh, diversity and variety in my uh, training, which was nice. Newly graduated and itching to experience Whistler's culinary and mountain scene, the young chef moved and began working in the resort's hotels and restaurants. In 2014, he was hired as head chef for the Rendezvous Lodge, with a little surprise in store. We wanted to bring something new. Lodge execs turned away to help recreate the restaurant's menu as part of last summer's complete renovation. I worked uh, quite closely with the executive chef Wolfgang. We spent a lot of the summer making a recipe, reworking a recipe, tasting the recipes. It wasn't the toughest of things, that's for sure, eating some amazing food. We're at the start of the ramen station now. Starting off with our pork belly, and then we move on to our two different types of broth. It's something that we bought in that we feel is a pretty cool additive to our repertoire on the mountain here. And turns out a large portion of this new station's ingredients, including these watermelon radishes, are brought in from overseas. The noodles, the broth, and the fermented bamboo are all things that we've actually bought from Japan to make sure we were, uh, made it as authentic as we possibly could. The Rendezvous kitchen staff also cook and serve up fresh Thai bowls and tacos, entrees as sustainable as they are authentic. We have tried to get all of our meat that is uh, hormone-free, antibiotic-free. We're trying free range with our eggs. It's a surprise for a lot of people to come up here and see the fresh, local, sustainable food that we're producing up here. And while this line only continues to get bigger, for this now 29-year-old head chef, his biggest accomplishment goes beyond the plate. When we'd finished the renovation here, we were talking about it and I looked around and uh, I realized that these guys were listening to what, what I was saying. It was a pretty amazing sort of feeling. I'd love to be up here for the next couple of years and really get this place dialed into where we know we can make it. I'm here with Sarah Morton, who's the Public Relations Coordinator for Whistler Blackcomb. First of all, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Uh, so let's talk about the renovation. It's a pretty cool space. I know that there was quite a bit of hype leading to it. You guys opened in the winter. Um, so first of all, though, what led to the idea to renovate this space? Um, it's been in the works for a few years now. It was finally greenlit last year, but uh, basically they just wanted to upgrade an, an aging structure and reinvest back into the resort. Yeah, you're saying uh, it was over two decades old, so obviously it was time. So what was the scene here though back in back in the summer? Was it completely closed or? It was completely closed. Uh, the whole building was gutted um, and the layout reconfigured. So amazing. Yeah. So let's talk about that layout. I was reading online, people were saying prior, it was a little convoluted. People come up the stairs, not quite sure where to go. So how have you improved the layout? Sure, yeah, we moved the door from the side of the building to the front of the building and that way guests have a, a, a more of a clear shot right into the cafeteria or to the ca cafe bar behind me. 
Um, it's also increased the seating capacity and created some really beautiful sight lines. Yeah, there's a lot more areas you can now see the sights, which is amazing. Yes, exactly. And you've also opened up, as you were saying, uh, the Raven's Nest. It's another vegetarian restaurant. So you really see kind of the scene of dining changing here uh, on the mountain. How much have you seen it change, what people expect in the last 10 to 15 years? Um, a lot of that can be attributed to the executive chef of Whistler Blackcomb, Wolf Gangster. He has a vision to provide the freshest, uh, healthiest options to our guests. So, you know, gone are the days of french fries out of a bag and it's all, yeah, exactly. He buys kale, he buys locally sourced products, locally sourced meats. Um, and Raven's Nest is very emblematic of that. And a lot of your guests, I know they're coming from Whistler, maybe other high up uh, cities, they, they expect that kind of thing, right? Absolutely. It's, it's elevated our dining, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. elevated the experience of skiing, for yes. sure. All right, well, thanks for joining me. Thanks. Appreciate it. And uh, coming up also, we'll try out some of that food uh, Sarah was talking about, some of that fresh cuisine as well. But let's throw to our first story. Uh, the man in our first story was likely craving some of the yummy food we see behind us. With the Syrian refugee crisis in full swing, millions of people around the globe are stepping up to help. And turns out one man in Vancouver is now sharing his experience with people in Squamish. Trusty caught in hand, Matthew Calling arrives at Squamish's Emergency Operations Centre to prepare for his presentation. He may have set this caught up a thousand times, but it still holds a deep meaning for the Red Cross worker. This is exactly the same kind of cot that we sent several thousand over to Germany. In the fall of 2015, Matthew spent a month in Germany, where he and his team served as the first point of contact for over 17,000 Syrian refugees. We set the camp up, we ran it. It was an amazing experience, but a very difficult one. Seeing a lot of the children and a lot of the malnourished infants and babies, that was very sobering. This is a picture of what that camp looked like. We separated families, minors, people with health issues. Tonight, the Vancouverite is sharing how he and his team managed to organize the overwhelming number of incoming refugees, along with pounds of donated clothes, water, and other goods with these members of Squamish's emergency social services team. That was one of the very few indoor spaces that we had to house um, people that was warm. Formed last year, the group of 20 one local day, volunteers really is also trained yeah. to be the first point of contact in the event of fire, flood, or earthquake along the Sea to Sky. December's minor 4.0 earthquake and this video depicting what would happen if a major one hit Vancouver is only reinforcing West Coasters need to be prepared. We really needed to have a good core group of people that are working with, uh, with getting us prepared for that. And also to be able to help on a more just community level. For volunteer Lydia, getting to learn CPR and other life-saving skills, at the same time make new friends, was an experience she couldn't pass up. I like to help people, so why not? If I can get some, some insight from Matthew on, on what helps the Syrian refugees deal with their situation, then maybe I can put that sort of thing into play when I'm talking to someone whose house is burnt to the ground and they've lost everything except for the pair of pajamas on their back. So far, the Squamish team has only been called out to Whistler Fire last year. We haven't really had a major incident. While their experience may so far be a far cry from Matthew's missions, for this international worker, no matter the magnitude of disaster he and others are called to, the site of compassion remains the same. Disasters are bigger than all of us, and we have to work together in order to have a chance at trying to recover from them. To see people all around the world rich and poor, willing to help their fellow neighbor is, is an incredible, enriching experience. Close to 500 Syrian refugees have arrived in Vancouver since the fall, so if you'd like to donate to the mission, or better yet, volunteer yourself, uh, just visit redcross.ca. Also a reminder that the Pemberton Emergency Social Services Centre is looking for volunteers to help with its emergency planning. So to sign up, visit pemberton.ca and click on emergency services. Well, don't go anywhere because when we return, we're going in the kitchen to try one of Wade's favourite dishes. Should be very yummy. Stick with us. Also coming up... It's kind of crazy. It's definitely a busy scene <laughs> and a fun scene. 
we head to Whistler Village to give Apre Ski a shot. Welcome back from the break. We're here on go at the Rendezvous Lodge on Blackcomb Mountain and in one of the best spots here in the kitchen where all the magic is made. And I'm here with again, joined once again uh, with, by Wade Wright. So Wade, you mentioned this is your most popular station, uh, the Thai Bowls. It certainly is one of the most popular stations. Uh, I feel that people are attracted to it with all the fresh ingredients that we sort of bring on board this year. Um, there's a lot of uh, cook to order, a lot of fresh, vibrant uh, colors as well as you'll see when we go down the end. Totally, when I saw it, I was, I was amazed that, you know, this is offered on a ski hill. So you've got, what, to everything from tofu to... Uh... Yeah, so we tried to give them sort of a very good option and we tried to change the options per station. So uh, we have the tofu here, we have tofu in other stations, but it's a different tofu, different, differently prepared. Uh, we have uh, some fresh meat by the pork ball, nice. house made, and then we go down to our uh, pork belly and then the chicken. So yeah. it's a coconut chicken marinade and the pork belly is cooked for a couple of hours. So a couple of different options and definitely uh, something to choose from for everybody. Yeah, and hard to choose for sure. It, it definitely, yeah. So I'm going to put you in the driver's seat then. You said you are going to okay. make me a, a bowl you'd recommend. Definitely, yeah. So uh, I always go with the noodles. Uh, okay. Authentic Japanese noodles. We really, we sort of, uh, we spent a little bit of time looking for these and finding them, and uh, that's what I would go to if I had breakfast uh, or lunch. Yeah, awesome. And then, um, to me, the chicken, the chicken's probably one of the best items, uh, but I think we're gonna go with pork belly today. Okay. It's definitely something to try, and it's something a little bit different that not all places have on offer. And this is mainly, you're saying, um, homemade, right, for most of the stuff? Exactly, as much as we can, as uh, we, we try to find locally sourced uh, products, and we try and do it as fresh as possible. So right now, we have the next options here. Uh, three options to choose from, so I'll let you choose because obviously we want you to enjoy it. I'm new to the whole kale, uh, uh, very so good I'm going to try some of that. Yeah, the kale's amazing. We've got the red and the green kale here. Uh, it's a little bit sort of, uh, it's got that little like kale tang to it, as well okay. as uh, a little bit of spiciness in the sauce. Okay. So then we go, uh, we've got green curry, red curry, tamarind and peanut. So tamarind and peanut don't really have any kick to them. And then the red curry and the green curry to start to uh, bring it up a notch. They get a little bit of heat to it and they bring something to the party. So okay. which one would you prefer? Oh, I have a bit of heat. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, For so we'll sure. go, go the red. The green is uh, where it's really at, but the red's got a little bit of heat to it. Okay. Nothing. It's got some flavor there. We spend uh, quite a lot of time over summer preparing these. Uh, we went as authentic as we possibly could with the recipes. So then uh, last options, we have uh, the papaya store or pickled veg. So it kind of takes the pickled veg, kind of brings uh, the palate cleanser to the end and the papaya is nice and sweet. So would you like one or the other then? Oh, papaya. Yep. Papaya sounds good. And you mentioned you guys start quite early in the day, obviously prepping and stuff. My main question, obviously we're on top of a mountain. Mm -hmm. How do you get the stuff up here? Uh, it's it's a definitely a bit of a challenge. Uh, we have cats, so at night the, we have a, a specially made cat that has a, sort of, a massive pickup truck basically. Okay. So we load on pallets and then they, they come up, they deliver them at night. We have a massive warehouse downstairs that holds all of our product. Oh and then we uh, unpack them during the day. So it's definitely a bit of a logistical nightmare at points and yeah. uh, it definitely brings a different different aspect to uh, cooking and a different thing to uh, yeah. ordering the food as well. It's an adventure for sure. So now lastly we have uh, crushed peanuts, black sesame seeds or a little bit of sambal so it's a it's like a, a chili sauce. Okay. Would you like one of the toppings? I'll do um, yeah, peanuts and chili sauce. Pan peanuts and chili? You got peanuts if it's Thai. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that looks so good. There we go. And so then that was, uh, that's how we would uh, make that's the bowl amazing. for everybody. Thanks, Wade. That looks delicious. You're welcome. All right, well, speaking of delicious food here, let's switch gears to Apre Ski. With my Learn to Ski series now finished, I thought I'd head to the village to see what the social event is all about. Hey, it's a tough gig, but someone's got to do it. Let's check it out. Well, now that I'm officially a skier, I'd say it's time to relax. And nothing says relax more than Apre Ski. Started in the Alps, it turns out Apre Ski now takes place in almost every restaurant in almost every ski resort, including here at the Garibaldi Lift Co. In fact, they say they consider their Apres to be an art form. So let's check out the masterpiece. It's kind of crazy. The sun comes out, a whole patio fills, the whole of the inside's full. Yeah, it's definitely a, a busy scene <laughs> and a fun scene. The word apre is French for after, and it's clear that here at the GLC, this is the way to celebrate after a full day on the hill. 
because they've had an amazing day on the hill. They want to celebrate or talk about how amazing their day was. We definitely have some great beer, great cocktails. After my day of skiing, I meet up with my friend and Apri ski expert Vanessa to try out this social event. It's just got an amazing vibe. Yeah, it's just, just really fun. Yeah. These fully loaded Caesars, just what the doctor ordered to boost back my energy. Of course, no girl's hangout is complete without some grub. You have to try the nachos. For this New Zealand native and so many other skiers and snowboarders, Apri Ski has almost become a daily or weekly routine, which, judging by these yummy nachos, isn't hard to see why. The event has become so popular, in fact, that even visitors, including Fraser, who's from the UK, put it at the top of their Whistler to-do list. They told us that the Apri Ski is pretty good, so we came down and checked it out, and uh, the live bands out here are really impressive. Now that I'm nice and warmed up, it's time to hit another spot that's been doing Apres Ski for over 30 years. It's a pretty much a big party. It's always back. Here at the Longhorn Saloon and Grill, 350 people pack its patio every day during peak season. Along with amazing views of the mountain, the saloon also has a live DJ, pool, and over-the-top cocktails to keep the party going. We have our legendary bulldog. It's a two ounce margarita, so it's uh, one and a half ounces of tequila, half an ounce of Cointro. It's a slushy margarita mix and a Corona flipped upside down inside it. It's wild, yeah, absolutely crazy. Uh, every time is a new experience. Just such a great vibe, we've got the good music on, live DJ, and uh, of course, the brilliant shot ski. I mean, you've, you've tried the shot ski, right? I haven't, that sounds kind of dangerous. You haven't? Oh, definitely. Come on, let's go try it. There we go. One, two. Today, the culture of Apre ski has grown just as big as skiing and snowboarding. And if this is what mountain sports is all about, count me in. It is so loud in here. I've literally lost my voice, but I gotta say, I'm so happy I finally learned what this Apre ski is all about. But I think I have a bit more research to do, so cheers. Judging by my messy shot ski, I think I need a bit more practice for that as well. But still, such a fun shoot to do, you can't complain. So thanks again to Whistler Blackcomb for helping us arrange it. And let us know where's your favorite place to go for apres ski in Whistler. You can reach out to us on Twitter and on Facebook. Well, switching gears now from apres ski to dogs. Because here along the sea sky, let's face it, we love our furry friends. Well, we recently stopped by Whistler's animal shelter, WAG, where three adorable animals are seeking a forever home. Well, here along the Cedar Sky, we have endless trails to explore. And you know what makes exploring those trails even better is having a dog beside you. So we're here today at uh, Whistler Animals Galore, otherwise known as WAG, to introduce you to a few friends looking for homes. This is Jesse. Um, let's talk about the first guy we have here, Jesse, Barnes. He's adorable. He is. <laughs> this is Barnes. He's about nine years old. He came to us from Montana. He was from a sled dog company. He was the head sled dog. It wasn't a great sled company in the terms that they weren't very socialized with people. Uh, so he came to us extremely scared, um, hadn't seen cars before, hadn't seen like street lights. So it was all new to him. Um, so he's been here for about two years now and um, he's come such a long way in that time. Um, you wouldn't be able to touch him. <laughs> we were here last year, I was going to mention, yeah. did a story on Barnes, and this is a big improvement, just speaking with a pet owner. Yeah. If someone was wanting to adopt a Barnes, what kind of lifestyle would they have to have where it would pair nicely? Um, so a kind of chill um, lifestyle, nothing too crazy, no um, young children, um, as like screaming and stuff will kind of yeah. scare him. <laughs> um, so yeah, just like an maybe an older couple or you know someone that um, has a, a quiet lifestyle but still likes to get out in the outdoors so a home with another dog is like prime for him. All right now next we have Stanley here who you mentioned was rescued from Mount Curry. Yeah we got him uh, last May he was uh, surrendered to us from one of our wellness clinics. He was just a big alpha male you know running around Mount Curry he didn't really have any manners he didn't know how to sit. He's come such a long way Initially, people might see the muzzle and be a little intimidated on the streets or whatever, but you said that's a misconception sometimes about Yeah, dogs. I mean, sometimes um, muzzles aren't always for, um, you know, aggressive dogs. They're also for dogs that eat things that they shouldn't be. And just for confidence for yourself to not feel nervous when you take a dog for a walk. 
And we got this little girl here, Rain, you're saying, one of the seven cats you currently have. Tell us about her. Yeah, so uh, Rain uh, recently came here a few days ago with her uh, siblings, there was four of them. And um, they're still getting used to people, so yeah. they can be a little bit scared and they like to hide in their cat trees, um, but they're getting more adventurous every day. And is that quite a uh, common thing you have here? Cats getting surrendered? Like along the sea to sky, it seems like it's quite popular. Yeah, um, just, you know, people don't not getting their animals neutered or spayed. Right. Um, and unfortunately having litters and, and not knowing what to do with them. Um, so if someone did want to adopt one of the three animals we're showing here today, mm -hmm. what's the process they, can, they go through? Yeah, so we put all of our um, animals on our website and you can read their um, bios on there. And then we also have our applications. Mm -hmm. And so the first step is kind of to fill out an application. We have um, a matchmaker program and that will kind of give us an idea of uh, your lifestyle and what you're looking for and right. um, we can pair you with someone that we think would be a good match. Yeah, what's nice is if someone wants to adopt, say, Barnes, they can come by your mentioning and you want that for them to get used to the dog, right? Repeated mm -hmm. visits. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. And let's talk about one last thing, the uh, charity challenge you have coming up, mm -hmm. come May, you do every year. What's that all about? Yeah, so we have a charity challenge. It's going to be a fun run um, like we had last year. Um, and so you can get together with your friends and um, your dogs and yeah, do a run in the name of charity. And nice. um, there's prizes um, and lots of things like that. And yeah. um, it all goes to wax. And, and pick up a new friend while you're at yeah. it. Yeah, so. <laughs> great right. cause. Well, thanks for joining me, Jess. No, thank you. If you'd like to see that full story we did on Barnes last year, just visit our YouTube channel and the link is on the bottom of the screen there. Okay, well with the yummy smell of food in the air, I think we should get back to the topic of food. So let's head up to Pemberton, where one restaurant is leading the way in locally sourced cuisine. While the sight of fresh trees of sausage is enough to water most people's taste buds, for Chef Randy Jones, it's how it made it to the chopping board that excites him the most. I call it the story behind the product. I think every single ingredient that we purchase has a story behind it. Motivated to tell those stories, a former Fairmont Hotel chef and his wife Cindy opened up Mile One Eating House, one of the city's first regionally sourced restaurants here in Pemberton in 2010, with a large portion of their ingredients coming from family-run BC farms and fisheries. It just makes sense because of where we live here. I grew up in, in BC as well, and you know we've always had fresh food available to us, and it just came so naturally. Along with Pemberton's signature potatoes, the restaurant also uses Pemberton Meadows beef, North Vancouver sausages, seasonal veggies, and Vancouver Island and Okanagan cheese in their dishes. For Randy, knowing the faces and stories behind each of his restaurant's products, including its over 35 BC craft beers and wine on tap, is not only a proud feat, but one more and more customers are expecting. Today's foodies want to know more about the product. People want to know where their food comes from. They want to know those pieces that just you don't get when you walk down the aisle of a grocery store. The most common questions that we get nowadays are about meat. So they've heard about the Pemberton Meadows natural beef. They want to know where they can get it themselves. We have an awesome selection of different sausages. To answer and cater to those questions, the restaurant has also opened up a foodie retail shop and bakery, otherwise known as the Market at Mile One, next to the restaurant this past spring, where customers can buy that very beef, along with daily fresh baked buns, natural juice, salt, and even soap from various BC producers. One of the products we have and that we're really proud of is our local tuna product. It's an ocean-wise, it's a sustainable product. Um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's local off of our coast. The, the fishermen's on Vancouver Island. It's just a relationship that we've developed that we're really proud of. With the company now employing over 20 staff members, the hope is to offer cooking classes teaching others how to bring these very ingredients to their own table in the near future. However, for now, this foodie chef remains passionate about serving up and sharing BC's vast food selection with others, bringing a whole new meaning to comfort food at the same time. It's super cool how successful it's been. It just feels like the right thing to do. And, and I'll be you know, perfectly honest, we can't do everything local all of the time. There's seasonality issues, there's price point issues, but where we can and where it makes sense, we love to have that additional piece. I think it just provides an extra level of almost entertainment within the business to know those, those layers of story. Chef Randy James also offers cooking lessons. Quite a neat experience as well. If you want to check that out, uh, visit their website, mileoneeninghouse.com. Well, Sarah, a lot of tasty eating we've done here today. It's been a great experience checking out the new lodge. So if people want to come check it out for themselves, what are the hours of operation? 
Uh, the Rendezvous Lodge is open the, as the same operating hours as the Mountain, um, and so is Christine's. Okay, and how does it work though when the actual uh, uh, winter season's over, obviously, will it be open later with the bike season, or? Uh, again, same operational hours, same as the Mountain, so. Okay, yeah. lots of time to check it out for sure. And uh, let's talk about Christine's also. We didn't get to touch on that, but you've also renovated that as well. People want to check it out. Yes, we've brought in a new head chef, Steve Ramey. He was the sous chef down at Hawksworth Restaurant in Vancouver. Uh, he's completely redone the menu, and like he likes to say, he's brought the city to the mountains. Hmm, lots to check out. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate Thanks. it. All right, well, that wraps up our show here, coming to you from the Rendezvous Lodge on Blackcomb Mountain. Also, uh, let us know, uh, what's your favorite thing to do up here as well at the lodge? Do you like to check out Christine's or the food? Uh, send us your pictures. You can email us at seatthesky at sjrb.ca. And you can also send your pictures to our Twitter and Facebook page. Just visit the link on the bottom of the screen. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Ibera.